<laughs> there, there's a famous word from, from the Rabbeim that I think in some place it even says that it's a word from the Alter Rebbe. But this is a word that the Rabbeim repeat. The Rebbe repeats it many times. The Friedrich repeats it many times. That it says in Chumish, Ve'ha'ish Moshe which means Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our master, our teacher, our Rebbe was the humblest man on the face of the earth so the Rabbeim explained and again in some places it says it's all the way back in the Rebbe that Moshe Rabbeinu saw the future Moshe Rabbeinu saw all future generations and he saw till the end of time the Ikhs of the Mashiach, the heel of Mashiach and when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the generations of the heel of Mashiach, I think the Lashon is, is a given Baziyach Arab Gefalen. Moshe Rabbeinu felt bad for himself because he saw the situation of Yidin as can be in the times of Mashiach. This is the vault, right? So the Friedrich Rebbe and his Maimarim quotes this vault more than once. That Moshe Rabbeinu saw the generation before Mashiach, the heel of Mashiach. And he was humbled by the generation before Mashiach. So the previous Rebbe says, this is the Nino Mesiris Nefesh. That in the times of the Friedrich Rebbe, to be a Yid required Poshet Mesiris Nefesh. Mesiris Nefesh Repoil, to be a Yid, Yabbi Mesa Nefesh. I heard a word once, I, I repeated it more than once. I heard a word from a Yid who's Nel Ma'emes. So, Mestam the word is Emes. His name is Mendel Drizn. I used to drive with him sometimes from Yeshiva. So he told me that the Rebbe said once in the Fabrengen, I said to make his that the Rebbe said once in the Fabrengen that there were three countries. There was a country of Teira, there was a country of Avaidah, there was a country of Gemilas Chassad. And the Rebbe said, from the country of Teira, nothing was left. From the country of Avaidah, we survived with Mesiris Nefesh. And the country of Gemilas Chassad remained the whole, and the Rebbe started to cry. That's the word. It said, there were three countries. There was the country of Taira, there was the country of Avaida, the country of Mils Chasad. It said, the country of Taira is gone as you believe. There's nothing left. From the country of Avaida, we, we survived with Mesiris Nefesh. And the country of Mils Chasad remained whole. And the Rebbe started to cry. So the Fiyidik Rebbe, his daughter, talked about Mesiris Nefesh. To be a Yid, to be Mesa Nefesh. The Rebbe, Zogazun our Rebbe, repeated this same word many, many, many times. But he changed it. He changed it because it's a different generation. He, he, the, the word is, that Moshe Rabbeinu was humbled specifically by the generation of the heel of Mashiach. But the Rebbe didn't say that what he saw was Mesiris Nefesh. He said, the Rebbe said was what he saw was al yevash mipnei amaliyim. That's what the Rebbe said. It, which means, literally, do not be embarrassed from those who scoff, those who laugh, those who try to dissuade you with uh, with all kinds of uh, strange uh, communications. In other words, Mesiris uh, Nefesh in America is not the same as it was in the old country. So it's nefesh in America is, is to be a yid without any shame. We say it's nefesh in America is to be a yid without care what anybody thinks, to know that a yid is different, that he has to act different, that he has to be different. And uh, forget, his greatest honor is when he acts in a way that separates him from the Goyim Lahab. I'll tell you Hashem Maise. I'll tell you Hashem Maise and I'll tell you Avart. Um, I heard the story as a bochad. I don't remember from whom. My memory is not what it was. But I heard I'm assuming it's a true story. I'm assuming it's a true story. Why would someone make a story like this up? But I don't remember from whom I heard it, but I heard it more than 35 years ago, Mestama. That there were Bach and the one on Mitzrayim in Montreal. And they went into an office building that had uh, uh, very sophisticated people. People, at least in their own minds, are very sophisticated. Prominent people, lawyers, and uh, yeah. the high-end kinds of businesses. And they were going from business to business looking for Yidin to do mitzvahs, put on film and so forth. 
They came into an office of a lawyer. A man was in his, uh, I don't know what, uh, late 60s or so, and they, or 50s. They came into his place, and they asked him if he was a Jew. And he said that he was, and he made it very clear to them that he does not want to put on tefillin. He also made it clear to them that they should never come back again. But he said to them, before you leave, I need to tell you something. And he told them the following. He says, I grew up in Montreal in the 1920s and 30s. You didn't want your neighbors to know you were Jewish. You didn't want people to know that you were a Jew. So if you wore a yarmulke, you wore a cap. Always. If you wore tzitzis, you tucked them into your pants. Because being, simply being identified as a Jew was, was a bad thing. It was, it was, it was, I don't know what. I don't know if it was real or imaginary. Was it dangerous or they were just, there was such a self-consciousness of being a Jew that they, they, they you didn't, not you didn't want people to know you're from. You didn't want people to know you're Jewish. Then, the Shluchim came, right? You know the story that in 1941, Tafshim Beis, nine Bacharim from Poland who had been sent, who went to Japan, were given visas into Canada. And they came to Canada, and they made yeshiva, mitem chatmimim in Canada, in Tafshim Beis. The famous, you know, they, those nine Bacharim considered themselves a unit. They were a kvutze, you know. Rabbi Kramer, and Rabbi Handel, and Rabbi Weinberg, and Rabbi Tenenbaum, and so on, Rabbi Radisky, I don't remember all the nine. And they right away made a yeshiva. The Rebbe sent to Reb Shmuel, Levitin, to help them start the yeshiva, the Fidelik Rebbe. And they started doing the same thing that would be done in America, right? What was the first thing they did in America? The first Lubavitch project was Mesiba Shabbos. Kids who went to public school would come to Shabbos to a shul and they'd make brachas. You have to remember those children who were coming to a Mesiba Shabbos 80 years ago, their homes were much more traditional. It's not like a kid today. Jew, kids who went to public school, their homes may have actually been from. And even if they were not from, they were very traditional. They had a very strong Jewish awareness. And Mesibah Shabbos was a big pooler. Hundreds and hundreds of children were joined in these Mesibah Shabbos, boys and girls. And for many of them, this was the Yiddishkeit budget for the whole week. And then a little while after Mesibah Shabbos started, the release time, the mitvah shah started, the release time, the idea of taking children out of public school, and taking them to a shul and teaching them Yiddishkeit, which goes on till this very day. So these Polish boys, these nine Bachrim who came to Canada, began to do all the things that the Rebbe was doing in New York. One of the Rabbi Korf mentioned before, that one of the first things that the Rebbe started to do was to make parades. To march in the street and announce I'm a Jew. And the, the, the understanding that we have is that parades is the Rebbe's own idea. Our Rebbe. The Rebbe Zogazun and our Rebbe was very, very into parades. And the Hezbe Bepashtis, this explanation very simply is that the, I'll say as a parenthesis as a Maimon Amuzger, there are a series of letters, a bunch of letters that were printed many years ago from the previous Rebbe to his Rebbe, to his wife, when he was here in 1929 and 1930. The Friedrich Rebbe used to keep a journal, a Yuman. And he used to write every day in his journal. But the journal had different forms. He had a tugbuch, he had a little calendar where he would write down briefly what happened that day. And then he had a, a form, he would write it out in long form, the different things that happened. So he would write letters to his Rebetzin about what he's experiencing in America. And this was really his journal. He kept those letters. When he came back to Poland, she, to Lit, Latvia, she gave him the letters. This was his journal. So in one of these letters, the Friedrich Rebbe writes to the Alter Rebbe and to his wife about Americans. He says, I came to a country where everything everybody does, they have to show off. Whatever you do, you have to tell the whole world. You have to advertise. Everybody has to know what you're up to. And then the Rebbe writes, forgive me for saying the truth, right? The Friedrich Rebbe wrote it to his wife. Stell sich vor, was hat er niedrige Menschen sie you understand Yiddish? Try to imagine how, how, how lowly a people they are, that everything they do, they show off. But when the Rabbeim came to this country, so the Rebbe's expression always was, Asla Sakarta Halach Bidibusa, you come to a land, you adopt its custom, and if in America everything is shown off, we're going to show off Yiddishkeit. So all of a sudden, boys and girls who were being raised in the Western Hemisphere, in Canada, in America, 
who heard in their home and in their community that you don't want your neighbor to know that you're a Jew. We're marching in the street holding placards, I'm Jewish. And these boys in Montreal began right away to make these parades. The Chathil of the parades were not on Lag Bohemia. Then it became Lag Bohemia. They made parades on a Sunday. They'd march in Eastern Parkway. They'd hold placards, keep Shabbos. The placards said, keep Shabbos. And the placards said, give your children Jewish education. So this Canadian Yid, this lawyer, says to these two Bachrim, he tells them everything I just told you. And he says, the Lubavitch Rebbe made Jewish people proud. We shouldn't hide. The Jewish people should be, they should, should, to be a Jew in the Western world, you have to have chutzpah, you have to be proud. You have to walk in the street and say, I'm a Jew and I don't care what you think. You know, to the Altach Siddish Avart. To the Altach Siddish Avart. We get this. As Ponim Lagahenim, Ubeishes Ponim Laganadin. You know what that means? If you're a chutzpah, literally it means if you're a chutzpah, you go to Gehenim. And if you're a more timid, Bashful person, you go to Ganadin, to Chassidim Taich. As Ponim, if you have Chutzpah, then the Gehenim, you can go into the real world and be a Yid. Boishas Ponim, if you're, if you're a, a person who's sheepish, you stay in Ganadin. <laughs> you have to be surrounded by holy people because you go into the world. It's going to eat you up alive. Rabbi Zalman Posner, Salman in Ganadin, has a story which everybody knows. That happened to him. What's the story? that he was a kid, he was learning in 770. I don't know how old he was, he was learning in 770, I think. And they were certainly learning in New York. Maybe they were learning in Tehem Das, but they were, him and his brother were here. So the brother was like, and the 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 Rebbe came, the Rebbe Zog Gesundheit, and our Rebbe came, seven, it says in the Yemen, seven tough shenar from Magil in New York, he came in seven, 1941, May, 1941, they came to New York. Four months later was Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah, there was a minion in 770. 770 had a shul, and there was a minion. And the Rebbe asks, someone's got a mute their phone over there. The Rebbe asks if there's any place to do Tashlich, right? We don't live in a shtetl, right? Lubavitch was a shtetl. So every shtetl had a river. If you had no river, you couldn't have a shtetl. But New York is a big city. So a lot of times, when you live in big cities, it's hard to get a hold of a river. So you can't do Tashlech Rosh Hashanah, so you do it during Aseris Yemei Tshuva. So the Rebbe asked, is there any place in walking distance that we could do Tashlech? I said, yeah, one mile from 770 is the Botanic Gardens, and there's a lake, and there's fish, and they open up the park. For care, they knew the Yidden were coming, they would keep the park open late. So they're going to Tashlech. Now remember, this is Tafshin Beis, 1941 to 42. The year earlier was a week, literally a week after the Rebbe and Ayatz, the Friedrich Rebbe had moved into 770. He moved into 770, So the year before, they already went to Tashlech, but the year before, the Rebbe wasn't here. So in 1941 to 42, Tafshin Beis, at five o'clock, he said about 80 men, 80 people gathered. Rabbi Posner said, 80 men and boys gathered, and they're going to go to Tashlach. The Rebbe, who was then called the Ramash, comes out of 770, and he sees all these people about to march to Tashlich. So the Rebbe says, Nitaze Gateman. That's not how you walk to Tashlich. The story happened 80 years ago this year. Nitaze Gateman. That's not how you walk to Tashlich. And the Rebbe says, Medavgein Tzvei Tzvei. You have to walk in pairs, like soldiers. And then he thinks for a moment, and Tracht thinks. Now you must understand what Crown Heights looked like in 1942. It was probably 80% Jewish, very, very Jewish. But it was a different kind of Jew, you understand. It was a Jew who was proud to have thrown off the shackles of how his grandfather had looked. Today it's very, very different. They were very American, they were very Jewish. Everybody was in temple. Nobody went to work that day. They went to a reform, they went to conservative, they went to Orthodox. Everybody was in temple. And they were all home. But they were not the kind of Jews who walked in the street and sang. They were the kind of Jews who tried very, very hard to be good Americans, to conform, to, to melt as the expression used to be. So Crown Heights, so all the way till the park, you know, if you, if you go Crown Heights, if you go towards the park, these big apartment buildings, they were mamish like candles. They were, they were new, and they were beautiful, and they were expensive, and the people who lived in them were quite well-to-do. 
a very high percentage of them were Jewish. And now these Hasidim have invaded their neighborhood and they're going to march from 770 till the park singing. So that's what they did. Thomas Poser said the biggest nest was nobody questioned the Rebbe. The Rebbe was a Rebbe at the time. He was the Chasna, the Rebbe Ayatz. The idea was so mishuga, you have no idea. You have no idea, crazy. In 1940, to march in Crown Heights and sing in the street, it was so embarrassing. Nobody questioned the Rebbe, said the watchers, he'd sing. It was Mamisha Pele. Nobody questioned the Rebbe. He wasn't the Rebbe yet, but they knew if he says to walk in the street and sing, you're going to walk in the street and sing. So they walk in the street and they sang. About 80 men, they went to Tashlich, they did their thing, and they came back. I understand, and I don't know this for sure, but I understand, Rabbi Korf remembers this, but I don't, that the Rebbe didn't go back the same way he came. If he came, went to Eastern Park, we went back with Union or President. In other words, there's reasons, primias the reasons why, but he didn't go back the same way. He came a different route, but he also was able to reach more people. So Zalman Posner, Olav Shalom, was about 14, I think, at the time. And he felt so embarrassed. He was so self-conscious. He, he was, he was, he'd grown up, he, spent, he was born in Etisro, but he spent his life in America. And he was quite aware of what America was. He was quite aware of how, when they went to Tashlech, every window opened. In every apartment, every, they wanted to look at them. And, and but they ever went to Tashlech, by the way, for 25 years. It stopped, I think, in Tashlech Avov. And when they ever went to Tashlich, the whole neighborhood would watch. It was a spectacle. It was one of the highlights of living in Crown Heights. Later on, it became much more respectful. But at the beginning, it's who are these Meshagoyim, you understand? So he was a 14-year-old boy who was basically American. And he, this wasn't his program, you know. To sit in 770, I learned Gemara was okay. But to walk in the streets of Crown Heights and sing was very difficult. So the way he tells the story was, I'm thinking that everybody's looking at me. There's 80 people, but everyone's looking at me. <laughs> he's 14, I'll cook of me. That's what he's thinking. So he, he, he said to himself, this is an indignity that I'll never live down. It doesn't say kefelech. So the next year, they became geholfen. That Reb Shmuel was the mashpia. Reb Shmuel Levitin was then, I don't know, he was then, he's 60, and he walked slow. And he also davened slow. Rabbi Shmuel davened slow. I mean, I don't remember Rabbi Shmuel, but I hear that uh, Ashayotza took a few minutes. He was an El Chayid. And the Rebbe did everything very quickly. So he says to Zalman, who was a Bach at Yeshiva, would he mind walking with him? They'll walk a little slower, they'll say Tashach a little slower, but he's going to miss the, the schus of marching with the Rebbe and singing. So Zalman said, would I mind? <laughs> would I mind? You couldn't do me a bigger favor. So he walked behind the Rebbe. The Rebbe went very fast. The Rebbe used to walk at Chadakot. They walked very quickly. They did their thing. They came back. When they arrived to the place of Tashlech, the Rebbe was already leaving. So they did it. They finished Tashlech and they walked back. So when they walked back, there was a lot of people who had come out onto the sidewalk who were still, who had, who had stopped their afternoon of Rosh Hashanah to observe the Chassidim. You know, it was a spectacle. And he says, amongst the people standing on the side was a man in his middle age, face 40, 50 years old, dressed very beautifully with yomtif, but no yarmulke, his head was uncovered. And he sees Zalman walking with Reb Shmuel. So he walks up to Zalman, pulls a 15 year old bachar, he grabs him by the jacket today, he would sue him and put him in jail. He grabs him by the jacket and says, why are they singing? Why are they singing? So he's thinking to himself, I I shouldn't have to do it, but now I got to explain it. <laughs> From the pan into the fire. But before he could say a word, the man continues. The man tells him. He says, every Jew has in his heart a fire, an ember. And the fire can become, and the fire can become quiet. And when they, this is what he said, when they walked by singing, I'm proud to be a Jew. I'm proud to be a Jew. That's not what they were singing. It doesn't matter what they were singing. It's what he heard. I'm proud to be a Jew. I'm proud to be a Jew. That ember ignited and burst into flame. And he walked away. In other words, this person told him what just happened. So Zalman said, Zalman Posner says, this was the first time people got a glimpse of the Rebbe. 
So this is Americana Mercedes Nefesh, right? We're Americans, Americana Mercedes Nefesh. It's not the same as the Mercedes Nefesh, your generation, but it's not necessarily easier. The Mercedes Nefesh for a Jew to be different. You know, the Rebbe spoke about this in so many contexts. He spoke, yeah, the Rebbe, when the Rebbe, the Rebbe teaches and preaches and believes. If you want a goy to respect you and not hate you, be yourself. So much of our history in the last few centuries is filled with people who believed that if you want to stop anti-Semitism, be as similar to the goy as possible. Don't stand out. Don't be different. And the Rebbe, every put him, listen to all the put him from an English. The Rebbe told the tragedy of that philosophy. He would tell the story of how what came from that attitude that the Rebbe always said, you want a guy to respect you? Don't be like the guy. Be yourself. Be proud. Be yourself. I'll tell you a, a piece of politics, right? The reform, the reform movement is their philosophy goes back 300 years. The reform movement began with anti-Semitism. Where it ended up, I don't know, but where it began with anti-Semitism. They lived in Germany, and they were very hated. So they had this idea that if they'll be very German, that they can find Hub, and you understand? They'll be very German, they'll hate them less. So their slogan was, I don't know exactly who said it first, but the slogan was, That's what they used to say. Be a Jew at home and a mensch in the street. In other words, there's a connotation here that Yiddishkeit and Menschheit are not exactly the same, which is, of course, there's nothing further from the truth. There's nothing more Menschish than being a Jew. And if you look at the world in which we live, you see today how without Yiddishkeit, you become mamish, a virtual animal. And you don't even see that you become an animal. But this was the slogan. Hey, Yehudi Bevesachaz, I have mentioned the name, I hidden the name for other Metesach. In the last few years, the reform are making public Hanukkah Menado lightings. Public reform temples are hiring Lubavitcher publicists to make public Hanukkah Menado lightings. Now think about it. When this idea started in the 70s, right? It went all the way to the United States Supreme Court and the Rebbe got involved personally. The Rebbe got the Hanukkah, the public Hanukkah Menados, the Rebbe wrote letters himself to defend it. And the head of the reform at that time wrote the Rebbe a note. He writes he wants to meet the Rebbe, whatever it is. But he also writes that he thinks it's a mistake, that the attack is of anti-Semitism. And the Rebbe writes him back. He says, if you had written me this letter a few years ago, I would have been able to judge, he says. But over the last few years, what we've seen, what the Hanukkah B'nai has accomplished. So they were dead set against any time Jews show off, which is what Chabad is, they're against it. Even the Fruma are against it. But the reform for sure. And now they're making public Hanukkah and the lightnings. What's like a What about anti-Semitism? That's what they And for the Gemara, And this is, this is for you, this time is for us. Each one in our own way, in our own, whatever we do, we live in the world. American Mercedes never should be proud to be different. And in, 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 in our community, you know, to that Today, there's, there's a lot of standards within Chabad. And for a person to be a chassid in the eifat of the chathila, to be the way that ever wishes a person to be without any compromises, and to be proud of it, and to not feel self-conscious about it, as simple as that sounds, this is American Mercedes Nefesh. American Mercedes Nefesh is to say, I'm a Jew, I'm a Lubavitcher, I'm a chassid, and yes, I absolutely want the whole world to know that I'm different. Absolutely. And they'll respect us for it. So, Chaim Velebrocha. What should I say? Ba'uz al Makuyim ven al Yevash Mepne Amaligim. We shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed or self conscious. We should know that when we are ourselves, people respect us more. And the mitzi- you see it, Babuchash. You see it in fact over time. Mm-hmm.